everyone. Welcome to our live stream. Today we're talking about how to choose a machine learning algorithm. I'm Heather Gore. I'm a product manager for MATLAB uh, with a focus on data science. And I did a lot of machine learning during my um, dissertation. And now I help a lot of MATLAB users um, do this, basically try to figure out how to choose a machine learning algorithm for their selves, themselves. Excellent. And I'm Joanna. I'm in deep learning marketing. Um, I am primarily responsible for web-based uh, deep learning. Uh, Heather's going to be the main presenter here. I'm going to be moderating the comments and uh, feeding questions to Heather as they come in. Yes, and so speaking of questions, you know this is supposed to be really interactive and live. So I have a lot. I have some things prepared, just basically kind of talking through some of the algorithms. I have some examples prepared that we'll just work through. Um, but really, you know, super interested in um, knowing what you guys want to hear about. And you know, if you have certain questions about different algorithms or about your data, you know, we really want to make this sort of guided to whatever you want. Um, so first, uh, there's a joke here on the screen. Uh, so it's one of my favorite XKCD cartoons. Um, it's basically, you know, pour your data into this pile of linear algebra, stir it up, and collect answers on the other side. So that is kind of what it seems like sometimes. Um, maybe we don't want it to be like that if you're, you know, a scientist or an engineer. Um, so you know, we'll talk a little bit about all of these different algorithms, and again, kind of with the lens of you know how to help your help you choose a machine learning model based on your situation and your data. So we'll just kind of quickly um, touch base on just the different types of machine learning. We'll talk about these um, individually, but just to kind of start out. Um, so we have supervised learning, where you ha you already know something, you're training a model to predict that thing. Right. So within supervised learning, you have classification and regression. Generally, classification is like a text kind of label um, or you know categorical kind of thing. Um, for example, we'll do we'll show um, the uh, human activity recognition where you're trying to see if someone's walking, dancing, running. Um, that's an example of classification. Regression. Um, this is something that people are you know familiar with a lot of times even y equals mx plus b is a version of you know regression so you know that's that tends to be more numeric and um, you know it's very multivariable um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that too then um, unsupervised learning I actually really love unsupervised learning it's where you actually don't know what's going on and you're just trying to see what's happening mathematically look for patterns clusters in the data so it's really cool really informative it's a lot of awesome stats going on um, and you know again this is kind of you know you don't necessarily want to give the model the label you just want the model to learn you know what's going on and help you uh, see patterns so I have stuff prepared again I've, I'm very passionate about unsupervised learning um, but I've found that many of these kinds of uh, discussions, people tend to want to learn more about the supervised learning. Uh, it tends to be more of a profitable <laughs> uh, endeavor if you, you know, can predict something. Um, so if please you know, put in the chat if you're interested in unsupervised learning. You know, that's definitely something I can go into. Um, but you know, we'll kind of skip, skip through that. So in terms of deep learning, we'll kind of put that also in perspective, just um, since we're talking about all of this stuff together. Deep learning is basically a subset of machine learning. Um, it's just deeper. It's a neural network with more layers. Um, and then you know, generally, you don't have to do as much data preparation, um, but you tend to need more data to train the model. So um, this will generally keep it towards the machine learning algorithms. But if people are interested, you know, again, definitely put it in the chat, in the comments, ask questions. We can certainly talk about deep learning. We're even having another one of these coming up soon on deep oh, learning. That's right. I'll be there too. Yeah, so, so Joanne will be back uh, for, for that one for sure. Absolutely. I think this is a good opportunity for machine learning, though, too, because we have a lot of material on deep learning out there. Um, and I think that sometimes machine learning kind of gets the short straw. But there's so much important information out there for machine learning, still very powerful. And I'm, for one, even though I'm a deep learning fanatic, um, very interested in learning more about machine learning today, too. Cool. All right. Yeah, and like you said, there's still a lot of really good applications. And you hear all the rage is about deep learning. But you know, uh, machine learning, there's a lot of art in you know, how you're preparing your data. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And I definitely am interested, if you have you know, crazy weird data that you have questions about, you know, uh, put it in the chat. And you know, we'd love to you know, kind of talk through some of this stuff. Um, so the example that I'll show, this is, uh, there's a, um, an example of this on the file exchange. Um, so we can set that, put that in the link so you can kind of get the data and follow along later. Um, but this is basically you know, sensors from your smartphone. You're just kind of walking around or sitting, dancing, doing different things. 
and we're going to use that to train a model. So I like this uh, because it's it's very interesting data. Um, you know, it's sensor data. It's not just a straightforward thing. You actually have to do something with the data before you can just start, you know, training models. Um, but so again, that's our objective. We're going to pass the sensor data into, um, you know, a model and you know get a classifier or you know train a classifier to uh, come up with our labels. So um, if you are using MATLAB, it's actually fairly easy to get started with this stuff because you can just use apps to really try out a bunch of different things. So you don't need to know anything about them, really. You can just try it out. Um, so that's what I'm going to do right now. So this is MATLAB. This is, oh, and this is my, uh, my own version of MATLAB that has the dark background. Yeah, Let your me MATLAB set that. doesn't look like my MATLAB. It's my MATLAB. It's not your <laughs> MATLAB. Um, but just also a tip, uh, in the preferences menu, if you like to set your colors like I do, I'll go back to the defaults. There we go. Hmm. All right, so I'm going to bring in the data. So it's buffered data. So it's already, the signals have already been sort of um, chopped up and done a little pre-processing so that, uh, let's see here. So each of the sensors has a bunch of statistical measurements. So you can see just a bunch of uh, numeric data, and then uh, we have our class somewhere here at the end. So you know you we took signals and then did you know statistical measures for each you know portion of data, and then made our data set. So that's kind of um, the way that a lot of machine learning algorithms expect the data to be arranged. It's sort of you know each um, variables are columns, and then uh, observations are along the rows. Um, I think that's pretty much as far as the data preparation is concerned. So <clears throat> again, if you have more questions, we can dive way more into that. But I'm going to just go ahead and open up the app. So in this case, again, classification. I'll use classification learner, trying to you know, predict the label. Um, I just, I'm bringing in the data from the workspace. And <clears throat> it will allow me to select uh, whatever variables I'm interested in. So it's predicting the activity, and these are all of my statistical measures from the signals. So um, you know, again, if you, <coughs> if you aren't really sure about what models to use and you know, what kind of things um, are assumed for models, you can literally try all of them. Um, and that's what I'm going to do now. I'll just start training things while we're talking. Uh, so you can see. All of <laughs> all of them here. If you have, well, I have a four-core machine, so they're uh, it's training quite a few at once. And <clears throat> one of the things is broken up here, so you can actually see some of the um, highlights about the models to give you a little bit of a sense of what they are. And um, also, oh wait, sorry, I need my zooming tool because this is really important. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some of the assumptions about some of the classifiers. And I think these are so awesome and super cute. Um, if you look at this one, it's you know, Gaussian um, naive Bayes. So it is kind of letting you know that it's assuming normal distributions for your classes. Um, you know, this is a kernel. So it looks, you know, it's looking at the shape. So it, it kind of gives you a little bit of a hint um, as to what, what expectations. Oh, yes, and something failed. That's <laughs> yes. awesome. It's not to most people, but I'm excited because it, you know, kind of shows that, you know, some models are more appropriate for, you know, different types of data. So it says uh, here, if you look, one or more of the classes have singular covariance matrices, and this makes the training fail. So um, the app will give you, so you notice this is grayed out for logistic regression. Um, so you know, it'll take some of those assumptions and you know, make sure you're not heading down the wrong direction. Uh, but basically, again, kind of try them all out and then take a look at what you got. So um, classic way to do it is to look at a confusion matrix. Let's just quickly look. And um, looks like all of our sitting and laying were classified properly. Um, and then you know, some of the upstairs and downstairs were not you know, classified as well. OK, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. But what are the, are there like five classes of things? Or yeah. oh, it's walking? Walking upstairs. upstairs, downstairs, sitting, and laying. OK. What's, what's the difference between sitting and laying? Interesting. So there's a, <laughs> um, if we did more unsupervised learning, um, gravitational, there's a gravitational sensor. So that's, I think that's the, the one thing that makes a difference. Um, 
so I'm probably now gonna go to talk about each of the algorithms okay. um, and then we'll kind of pause for questions we'll come back to see what what uh, algorithm won <laughs> the game <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah I kind of mentioned this before but you know you, you can use all different types of data you really just kind of want to be mindful about the expectations and what the algorithm is expecting is in terms of um, transformations so we see a lot of image applications using deep learning now um, you know because you don't really have to do as much you know finding histograms and doing all this crazy stuff you can just pass it right in um, but otherwise, everything else, or even if you do want to use machine learning for an image, you can pull out, say, um, a wavelet vector or you know, some representative information from the image um, to build up your, your data set. So again, you know, make sure you kind of speak up at, you know, as far as you know, what kind of data that you have and what you might be interested in um, talking about. So generally, you know, we kind of saw this a little bit with the activity data really quickly. But this is sort of what the machine learning models expect. So you have predictors or features. You know, these are just you know, your variables or your transformed variables, you know, your information. And then um, you have your response or your you know, class that you're trying to predict. But so you know, again, it kind of just expects like, each row to be a different measurement um, and each you know, separate column to be a um, separate piece of the model. right? So, you know, again, basically, you want to just transform your data to be like that. So if you have text, you can use a lot of different techniques, like uh, TSNU matrices, you know, different ways to just represent those as a matrix so it's basically in this kind of form. So <clears throat> in terms of, you know, I'm just going to kind of bust through all of the algorithms, I guess. I'll, I won't, I'll still pause on the coffee grinder uh, slide for a moment, because it's kind of nice. I like that. <laughs> It's basically kind of what you're doing. You know, you're you're putting a lot of these variables into the machine and uh, having the machine figure out uh, the relationships and give you back your result. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the easiest one. Um, I think I'm also going down the list of what how it shows up in the classification learner. Um, but so neural ne or nearest neighbor, not a different <laughs> NN. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. That'll be, don't use that. I'm going to write a paper about it. Yes. Um, Future classifier. <laughs> so nearest neighbor is the easiest one to explain. So I like to start out with that one. Um, basically, it's just doing a bunch of distance calculations, right? So you know, and it takes a new data point, and it says, OK, how close am I to the points in the classes? And compares to all of them, and then goes for that. So you can change, you know, there's a lot of art to this too. You, know, you can change the k, so that's how many neighbors it's going to consider. Obviously, one is probably going to give you a lot of noise, or you know, you might be um, seeing more, you know, noise being classified. But if you, you know, broaden it out, you can see in this sort of <laughs> basic picture that you know, if you say four, it's more likely to be a red little box. Um, but that's the idea. And then you also have a bunch of options for the distance measurements. Um, I'm actually going to bump, bump into the doc right now. Oh, geez. Maybe I should have gotten there from MATLAB. Um, so I can, I just wanted to show some of these um, algorithms or like some of the pages so you can see um, some of these options. So you, there's even nice math. Oh, sorry. Also, I'll get out of dark mode. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but so you can really dig in, and you know if one of these makes more sense than the others, you know the default is a Euclidean distance, but there are many many options um, for how you want to um, work with that. All right, good. So that was um, nearest neighbor. Um, another popular one. This is actually a really old one. Naive Bayes has been a around for a really long time, um, and it does a lot of sort of reasonable statistical calculations, and it's really fast. So it fits. Um, distributions based on the assumption that the classes aren't the same, um, or that each class is in, uh, unique. And it um, estimates the posterior probability of belonging to the classes, and then uh, classifies based on that. So it's one of the ones that are, um, well, if you can understand the words I just said, it's a little easier to understand why the predictions were made. Um, especially if you know a lot about the way that your data is distributed, and you know, you've done a lot of the statistical background information on your data, Naive Bayes can be really good. It's really popular for text, or at least it was before um, deep learning became all the rage. Um, so that's pretty much Naive Bayes. So another one I like to follow uh, discriminant with, uh, or 
follow naive Bayes with discriminant because it's really similar in the way that it does the assumptions and the calculations. So discriminant is a, it fits a multivariate normal distribution, um, class independent. So it's similar to what I was just talking about. And it estimates, it looks at the covariance matrices um, to estimate the differences between the classes. And it's a linear, linearly separable hyperplane is Whoa. the assumption. I know. <laughs> I got all those words right on the that's first That's awesome. Time. I like Usually it. Usually I just type them. Um, but so that's kind of, it's you know, making that assumption that there's this relationship that's going to separate everything out. And it's a hyperplane because it's n-dimensional. You know, um, no, fancy words, but not a big deal. <laughs> So uh, one of the things, too, with discriminant, you can use kernel, uh, or um, not kernel, but uh, quadratic. So you don't have to just stick to uh, strictly linear. There are a couple options. So uh, that does it for <laughs> discriminant analysis. Again, unless people are asking questions, I'll just kind of no, give some highlights through. and then. I like oh. the kind of the high level, like, what's in the classification <laughs> learner app. I think it's great. Cool. All right. It's stats in 60 seconds. Uh, Algorithm in 60 seconds or less. Ooh, like that. <laughs> All right, so um, classification tree is another really super popular one um, because it's, again, sort of easy to backtrack the decisions. I mean, easy if you can read a bunch of binary decisions. Um, but that's really all that happens. So it just kind of takes each variable, and you know, if it's greater than this or less than this, go this way. And it splits, and it just does that over and over again um, and learns from the data that way. So you know, this is why one of the reasons it's really popular, because it can work with a lot of different types of data, really like literally any data that you work with, a lot of times trees will learn. Um, but you do have to be careful because it can tend to fit the noise. So you definitely want to test. And um, we'll see in the app, you'll see uh, there are en ensemble methods. So that's where you have a whole forest of trees. Um, I, know. I love the tree puns so much. And there's a, there's a pruning function. So <laughs> it's really awesome. I love it. <laughs> it's the, those are like the technical terms. Like literally, too? Oh. yeah. So and it's really cool actually. Um, if you let's actually see if this is done. Oh, I'll come back to you. I'll, I'll finish the rest of the explanations and come back. But there is, um, if you look at the tree visual in MATLAB, you can prune and you can see the like branches like getting trimmed. Um, but that's the idea is that if you have you know all the branches, it's going to fit some of the. It could potentially fit some of the noise. So you want the simplest tree, you know, or the simplest model generally as possible. All right, but so yeah, anyway, the ensembles um, tend to be much better because then you have multiple trees and you basically just do um, a majority vote. So that tends to be a little bit better. All right, another really popular one um, is SVM, especially with like computational efficiency. Um, so SVMs are also really similar to discriminant analysis, where you know you're um, estimating mean covariance, a lot of these uh, parameters in the beginning, and then instead of taking every single point and looking at the neighbors or the uh, you know classes, it's just looking at the ones that are closest to that hyperplane, so that that separation. And that way, it can be way faster, because it doesn't have to look at every single point. It just looks at the really important ones that sort of hold that information. Um, and then you also, it's really popular because you have even more options, because like um, discriminant, you only have a couple of options how you deal with the calculation, like linear, quadratic, you know, a few. But with um, SVMs, you have kernels, you have uh, multiple different uh, calculations. So you can um, find a lot that works with your data. So I guess I think this is last but not least um, neural networks. So we have um, there's a bunch of different functionality in MATLAB. You know, we, again, there's a lot of uh, stuff out there in deep learning. But so just kind of stepping back, like what is a neural network? So um, these are neurons. The nodes are basically neurons. It's sort of how your brain works. Also, that's um, why it's called that. Um, and you have different layers, right? So we said deep learning. You have many, many layers. All uh, networks have the same structure. Input, your hidden layer, and then your output. So, I mean, input and output, pretty obvious. And uh, the hidden layers are where, you know, it's basically just doing a bunch of weights and biases and um, estimating those and doing a summation at each of the nodes. So, <laughs> obviously, that's very over oversimplified. You can imagine it's doing that over and over and over again um, as it learns your data. Um, but so. You know, because it's kind of generic like this, it's really good. It's good for classification. You can use it for regression, even unsupervised learning. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, deep learning, there's a wide array of applications for that. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I think. Yeah, I've we'll got some questions for you if you're yeah, if you're ready. Perfect. Ooh, All right. Wait, should Ooh, I? Yeah. This, I forgot <laughs> about this one. No, this is good. This is good. It kind of pulls it all together. Um, so you know, this is actually also sort of in the doc. I took a couple liberties. Um, no offense to anybody, uh, but there is some really nice stuff to the kind of help you through this process. You know, what does your data look like? What do you need? Um, and here are some tables that show uh, some of the trade-offs of you know, using different algorithms. So I basically lifted that and added a couple extra things. So the things that I added I think are really important. I mean, you know, memory usage, prediction speed, blah, blah, blah. But what are the assumptions about the data? So I kind of just put in here the things that I just said, basically, where you know, trees could be anything, you know, discriminant is multivariate, normal. Oh my god, why does it always try to update my computer during a live stream? Always. Let's not do that. It's like it knows. It does know, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, we'll maybe do a predictive model, uh, not Fridays at 2. So uh, I kind of think of data as linear and nonlinear. That's a really black and white way to look at the world, because most things are not that simple. But if your data is linear, or if you have like linear-ish relationships, or relationships that you can kind of model with stats or normal distributions or these things make sense, um, you can pretty much use any model. Now, if you have nonlinear data, which a lot of MATLAB users do with you know, signals and simulations, um, you kind of want to stay away from the ones that have a lot of assumptions about those you know, normal distributions and things like that if that's not appropriate. Um, so the ones that tend to work really well are you know, nearest neighbors, trees, uh, neural nets, and SVMs. So yeah, we can. Pause and take some questions. Absolutely, that sounds great. Okay, so we've gotten a couple questions so far, um, and I think that you're, I think uh, what you're showing right now is, is pretty helpful. So um, oh, keep um, it up. Uh, yeah, keep <laughs> Sorry, it up. Hold on. Um, so uh, let's go back to your slide where you're talking about uh, clustering and um, unsupervised and supervised learning. So let's just um, be really clear on unsupervised learning versus supervised learning. Mm -hmm. um, so unsupervised learning means what exactly? So you don't necessarily have a pattern that you're trying to train. You're just looking to see what patterns exist already. Okay. Um, often you do have that pattern, but you're not feeding that to the model. So unsupervised is just like, I, I don't know anything. You're not telling me anything. You're just giving me data and maybe tweaking some distance measurements or something. Okay. Um, so that can be really useful if you just don't know what you're looking at. And a lot of times these go hand in hand. Like for my um, dissertation, I was working on a thing, you know, whatever, it doesn't have to, <laughs> I won't have to go into detail. Um, but the first part of it, I wanted to do clustering to make sure that what I was going to do next was going to work. So, you know, is this going to be separable enough for me to even train a classification algorithm? So a lot of times these can go hand in hand. Okay. No, that's, that, I think that's helpful, um, just to kind of like uh, making sure that we understand that like um, clustering is sort of like you don't really know what's going to happen. Right. Um, whereas like classification and regression, it's like you, you want a specific outcome to happen. Right, and you're telling the model exactly that outcome. That sounds excellent. Okay, uh, something a little more specific. What is the best or a machine learning algorithm if you wanted to categorize maybe text? Let's say you wanted to categorize URL addresses or um, a specific amount of text or, or something along those lines. Good. So um, a lot of them, let me go back to this. Oh, man, now I have to shuffle through all these things. OK, here we go. So um, that is a lot of categorical data. So um, there some of the algorithms even here it shows you know discriminant. You can't have categoricals. So that's one you want to stay away from. Um, and one, I'm trying to think. Naive Bayes is good for this because, like, yeah, Naive Bayes, SVMs, trees, those will be really good. Okay. Um, but again, you want to use uh, categor cate <laughs> make sure it's a categorical data type um, in MATLAB, and then it'll you know, know the appropriate levels and things like that when it's doing the calculations. OK, two more questions, and then I think we can move on. Um, the first one uh, is whether or not you can, I think you've actually mentioned this already, deep learning, um, unsupervised deep learning and whether or not that's available 
Um, do you have any? Do you have any comments on that? I, I have a few as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, I I would say you go ahead. Okay. You, I've been doing all kinds of talking. <laughs> <laughs> so because of that, I was able to look up online and find some good documentation on um, unsupervised deep learning. Um, so there's a really there's a lot of ways of going about that. So it it's kind of a general question, and it really depends on what you're trying to do. The first thing I want to point out is if you're talking about unsupervised uh, deep learning, uh, we now support GANs, um, and that's out in the latest release. So you might want to check out GANs. That's a way of being able to kind of learn from your data um, and actually create new data from that as well. Um, reinforcement learning is another way of doing a kind of a semi-unsupervised deep learning where it kind of learns from its surroundings um, based on a reward system. Um, and then finally, um, MATLAB supports autoencoders and very variational autoencoders, sorry about that, uh, for unsupervised learning as well. And so I'll start putting some of those links in the, in the uh, chat. And then if anyone has any other questions about like some of the links that we've been showing as well, I can start putting those in the chat as well. But before I do that, I want to ask you one more question. And yep. this kind of brings you back to your classification learner. Um, you just started using multiple cores. How did you do that? Um, I, I really just pushed a button. <laughs> uh, so if you're using the app, there's a button here that's just uh, use parallel. <clears throat> so no problem there. Um, generally, in the models themselves, if you're using, let me actually generate a function and see. Um, they're generally like a use parallel true flag. So you don't have to do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, par four or anything like that. Um, I don't see it on here. Yeah, usually it's just passed in, like yeah. use use parallel true, um, something along those lines. So, yeah, fairly easy to distribute like that. Yeah, normally in the apps there is a button, which is nice yep. and very helpful. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Excellent. All right. So I think we can move on from there. All right. Cool. So let's just go back. I guess um, some of these aren't quite finished training, but for our our cubic SVM uh, one, the game, <laughs> just. just. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, you know, not complete uh, the task. So are, so are some actually still training now? Yep. Or? Yep. So that's actually another point. So the ones that are still training are KNNs and ensemble KNNs. So some of these, like, because, uh, you know, the nearest neighbor, it's doing, you know, comparing every point to every other point a million gazillion times, <clears throat> it can take a while. So SVMs can take a while, uh, neural, or um, I keep saying neural, um, nearest neighbors, and, uh, those are the ones that, you know, I'll just tend to kind of close those out, um, you know, whenever I first start training, if I don't. Oh, there's also even a all fast to train. So if, you know, you just don't have time for that, all quick to train, you can just go for that. Oh, nice. Okay. And then, yeah, all linear. So again, if you know you have linear data, you know, you can um, go for it. Oh, Heather, what hardware are you running on right now? Um, this is a Lenovo laptop um, with a delightful cover on it. Um, it has four cores, I think, and a GPU. Should give more info. A Quadro. That's okay. That sounds fancy. There we go. All right. Yeah, I don't know as much about my laptop. I know a lot about my Linux machine if you care about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're good. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so let's talk about regression. Um, actually, let me um, pull in that example. I'll stop our classification example. And so for the regression, um, we're going to use just uh, a, the car example. So if you've ever looked up any um, of these in the doc, you might have seen that one already. But it's basically <clears throat> we're just you know trying to predict uh, the miles per gallon based on a bunch of information. So this is a good one, although we're doing a numeric regression um, problem. This is very similar to, you know, you have different categories like address and whatnot. You know, there are early, uh, you know, USA, like different origins. So, you know, good data set for that. And again, we're predicting MPG, which is the um, numeric value. I guess that also could be categorical. Because hmm. they're like, you know, well, are they like classes? Like 31? Well, maybe not. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So brought in the car data, predicting miles per gallon. Um, once again, I'll just try them all. Why not? So you'll notice um, I'll, I'll have less work to do because some of these we've already talked about, like trees and SVMs. Now we're just predicting numeric values. 
right? So I'll go ahead and hit all again, and then we'll uh, talk through them. So I am going to not, I'm going to deselect s stepwise, um, and I'll explain why in a moment. OK, so <clears throat> all right, regression algorithms. Um, linear is uh, sort of the most broad, common, um, easy for people to understand. And you're basically just doing a parametric fit, um, multivariate, and uh, again, it's kind of like that y equals mx plus b example, a little more complicated, though. Um, then within linear models, there are a bunch of different classes. Uh, so in our case, we have some options where you can, or in our case, in MATLAB, the case of MATLAB, we have options where you can ignore outliers um, from the function itself. So uh, you'll see that in the app. Also, it's just um, robust linear fit. So if you, you know, it's using the relationship between the data to identify the outliers, and it's just not incorporating those. So you don't have to like delete them or get rid of them ahead of time. And then you can also do like you know weigh them just a little bit differently. So the stepwise model and the very reason that I stopped it um, is because it just it goes through and tries all the different parameters and then you know tries all the different combinations of them and it just literally just steps right through them. So it's great if you just want to kind of try it out, walk away, come back, and get a really good model. There's a million times that I've done that and then you know I'll dig in from there. But it's just something to keep in mind. You know it's it's just going to take a long time to um, keep fitting and fitting and fitting. So um, logistic regression, in principle, it's sort of the same. Um, let me zoom in on the equation, because everybody loves equations. Um, so it's principle. I, I don't know. I don't think so. But nobody's stopping me, so I'm, I'm doing it. That's very true. <laughs> so um, it's very similar. As you can see, this was basically what we saw with the linear regression. Now we're just using a log odds or log et um, you know, relationship for the transform. So one thing about this, you, you'll see some t it's grayed out frequently for me. It's only, um, you, actually, you can use this for classification, too. So um, for classification, it's only a two-class classifier, and it's basically just probability of belonging to those. Um, and otherwise, again, it's very similar to linear, but it has um, the you know, log it relationship. You also might hear, uh, I don't have a special slide for it, I forgot. But generalized models, if you hear um, generalized regression or um, linear or logistic, you'll he uh, yeah, again hear that, but it's using maximum likelihood instead of least squares or you know MLE. Um, I think this is the last regression slide. So uh, GPR, Gaussian process regression, this I think of basically like smoothing or a convolution or some kind of like windowed calculation, like a spline, right? So. It's often good for nonlinear kind of data or really any data. Uh, you can provide, you know, the um, it's the process uh, is you change. So you can, I'll explain more whenever I get into the app. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's like an exponential equation. And, you know, basically, you know, I think there's like four or five different ones. Uh, but again, this is good for, you know, the sort of seasonality and um, exam taking more information from the, uh, seasonality of the data. I do not have a fancy comparison uh, slide like I did uh, before. Oh, I know, I really should have made one. Um, but I do want to just go back here really quickly and talk about the couple of things that we didn't talk about. So the uh, trees, again, same principle. It's just that you're now predicting a numeric value instead of um, categorical. And then same thing for um, SVMs. So you, again, you can have all of the different options that you had for classification. Um, and then here are the options. Yeah, see, I can never rem remember my turn five over two. <laughs> I'll give myself a break. Um, so you know, again, you have a lot of options. And um, same that we saw before, you have ensemble methods. Uh, again, tend to be a bit better, especially when you're dealing with trees and things like that. So. Oh, who knew? GPR worked out uh, best. All right. So uh, this is looking at, you know, it's, I think it's super easy with classification. It's just a percentage. Um, this is uh, mean squared error. So you want, like, zero. Um, sometimes, you know, it's hard to gauge what, you're, what you should expect, you know, depending on your uh, problem. 
but obviously zero is good. Uh, in terms of how to interpret this, you know, I'm looking at the plots, uh, the scatter plot, and you know how it was predicted. But you can also look at uh, something like this, where you know you want to see everything along the same line, so it's just predicted, you know, versus actual. And yeah, same thing. So these are the residuals. You just want zero. So what um, toolbox is the classification and the regression learner in? Oh, good question. So the everything I've just showed so far is in statistics and machine learning toolbox. So both uh, classification and regression. OK. And then to do anything deep learning, you'd want the deep learning toolbox too. Yes. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right, good. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have for regression. Um, again, we you know talked a lot about the um, you know the other ones in the classification discussion. Mm -hmm. So we'll pause to see what kind of questions we've got. Right. So I, I'm sorry if I missed anything on, on specifically on regression. Um, uh, some of the uh, some of the questions are just a little too specific, if you will. Um, we can always take those offline. Um, do we have a an email address that we give out or no? No, but we can um, try to answer them in the comments afterwards. That's we can put true. them in the comments. Right. Okay. So anything specific, you're welcome to keep on posting in the comments. Um, but I probably might not get to them during the actual live presentation. So keep them coming. Um, and basically, how about um, if someone's just getting started on machine learning, um, where are there any links that you would recommend or any places in the doc that you would like point them to, or maybe um, just some new examples and stuff as well? Yep. So I think. And I'll try to follow along with yeah, you. Yeah, I want to. Let's. We'll, <laughs> we'll find watch out. Watch me Google. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a page that has all the stuff sort of collected. Ooh, OK. And yeah, so there. <clears throat> actually, even on um, our YouTube channel, there's if you if you like hit back and up or something, um, there's a couple of nice series of videos that you can go through. You know, that has a tutorial, more uh, less feel. So you know, you can follow along with a the code. There are we have a couple of ebooks. Um, those are good. Again, kind of quick intros, and there should be a link here. Well, I was already in um, the doc. Mm -hmm. But so if you go to the documentation and into the statistics machine learning toolbox, I just tend to start with examples. Um, you know, just try different stuff. Try to see something. You know, again, I guess it depends on why you're getting started with machine learning. If you want to just learn about it, you know, there are a lot of really cool courses and you know, uh, free available things like that that you can go really dive in. Um, if you want to just try to use it <laughs> and try to you know use it for work or something like that, I think it's just easy to just just go at it with examples. Um, so you can, I mean, there's a nice button. You can just sort them and find something that's kind of similar to what you want to do. And a lot of these are really, really detailed. Uh, some, some people don't like that. <laughs> um, I tend to. But it has a lot of information about the algorithms. Um, this one isn't a very good one, so I'm proving myself wrong. Um, but I, I've learned quite a lot just from following examples. You know, um, even like the you know GANs, like the new um, networks that are coming out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not as up as I used to be, so I'll go and like follow a couple examples in the doc, or you know, find something on GitHub and just look around. Um, I think that's pretty. I think that's, that's a good, good. I think that's a good start. A good start. Um, we do have videos um, all about machine learning too, just mm -hmm. like. What is machine learning? What's the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Um, what's the difference between classification and regression? Those kinds of things as well. Um, and they're just like quick, like snackable three-minute videos or something like that. Yep. Um, and so we'll put a we'll try to put a link in the um, in the in the chat as well on on all of those as well. Yeah, and I think those are even those might be on YouTube also. So there oh, should yeah, they be are on YouTube. It's I the play the YouTube playlist, if you will. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good for now. Why don't you keep on going? If there's any other um, kind of like high-level topics um, that you wanted to talk about, I think that that would be good, sure. and then we can kind of wrap up after that. Sure. All right. Oh, if I have some time, I'm doing super unsupervised learning till till we get uh, cut off. No, I do, so I do want to talk about uh, model tuning. So you know, once you know, say you just use the app, you're pretty convinced. You use my uh, vague linear, nonlinear guidance, and you chose a model. Um, you still may have you know you might want to update it, obviously. So uh, depending on your problem, there are different ways to uh, mitigate it. So a lot of times, especially again, what we hear for um, engineering data, you have imbalanced data where you have a bunch of um, you know 
say it's a normal day versus a bad thunderstorm or something like that. So most days are normal. You only have a couple of days with a bad thunderstorm. So you, you really need to figure out, you know, a model isn't going to learn that well if it doesn't have enough of that, you know, data point. So there are different techniques aside from, you know, uh, simulating. You can um, weigh classes, so you can, um, you know, through the functions that you're using to split up the data. And then, um, you know, ensemble we talked about with trees, you know, those are good because you just do it over and over again so that it's not, um, you know, you're less sure that it's fitting the noise. So uh, a couple of nice things that actually, if you haven't, if you've been using the uh, apps, um, in 19B, there is now, uh, let me go back to the classification learner. So you can do hyperparameter tuning and uh, apply a cost matrix in the app, which is really, really uh, handy. Wow. So um, before, I mean, you can always uh, do this programmatically. And hyperparameter tuning, you know, once you, again, you find a model that seems pretty reasonable, and you just keep tuning or optimizing the parameters. So you can give it, you know, uh, a window and just say optimize, go for it, figure it out, and it'll come back with the best parameters. So you know that's a good way to get, you know, the the best model you possibly can um, through, you know, that mathematical mechanism. Um, but uh, you also could. So all right, let me pause. So you can all do this in the app now. So where it says optimizable something, that means it's a hyperparameter uh, tuning. And before I do that, because I think it's going to stop, you can also do misclassification costs. So say um, in our example, we want to you know, really penalize uh, walking and sitting and laying. So you know, if walking is very different from sitting and laying, right? So we could say uh, something like this. We want to give it a 5 instead of 1. So this is basically saying that like all misclassifications are equal. <laughs> And now we're saying they're not equal. It's real bad if it's sitting and laying, and it's supposed to be walking. OK, so the higher the cost, then, or the higher the number, that means like the more you're penalized for doing it right. wrong. Yeah. Or for misclassifying it. it. Yeah. OK. It costs more. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that right? makes sense. Okay. I like it. All right. Um, so again, those are some pretty handy techniques. And again, kind of easy to just play around with, um, especially now with hyperparameter tuning. Um, and there's a lot of details. You can go uh, many examples for how to tweak these things. Um, but again, you can just pass it right into the model and get back the tuned one. Um, so there were questions about hardware before. If you don't have this snazzy MathWorks issued laptop like I do uh, with GPU, <laughs> um, that I'm very grateful for, uh, you can scale to a cloud. Um, th this is more for deep learning, uh, but it also applies. We were saying use parallel true is the same kind of idea. We try to make it pretty easy to scale like this. So you can use the same script um, when you want to train, say, on all of your data. Um, and then if you don't have the kind of hardware available, you can use the reference architectures to run your MATLAB on you know, AWS or Azure to like grab a bunch of GPUs or more CPUs, if you like, and go to town. So. Uh, yeah, there's some links we'll send out. Um, I'll pause again for questions, and we'll again. I can do some unsupervised learning if if anybody wants. Sure. <laughs> All right. So um, so Joseph has asked if there's any um, scenarios where you wouldn't use machine learning. I said you should what? always <laughs> use machine learning. How dare you? <laughs> um, no, that's a great question. So we. I, I mean, I I think it's really up to you. Um, but there are definitely a lot of cases where a physical model or a very simple you know, equation is a much better way to do your modeling task. You know? um, I think this is also especially true. You, hear, you may hear about you know, model explainability. If, say, you're in you know, a regulatory industry and you're um, you know, doing drug delivery or something, um, you have to be able to you know, ex explain exactly what happened with your model. So you have to really be careful about using just a black box. So people still tend to use you know, uh, kinetic models or other things or sim more simple uh, machine learning models. So I think those are the cases where you know, it would probably, you know, simplest the, the better. You know, I think mm -hmm. machine learning is awesome, but you know, it's, uh, I've seen quite a few memes about it recently where you know, people are kind of like overthinking things with machine learning. I won't try to like, make the joke because I know it's not going to work. Um, but yeah, 
So. Okay, one more question and then we can move um, move on. I think you, you might have like, like we can do like speed unsupervised okay. learning or something like that, like five minutes or less. <laughs> um, the, the last question is, I, I'm sure a lot of us, um, the people who are joining us today are from academia. So um, is MATLAB um, or even the machine learning toolbox used outside of edu, education? Yes, definitely. So I think it's probably more so outside of education. <laughs> so for example, um, I'll give a really great example. So one of the early machine learning courses by Andrew Eng uh, used MATLAB. And uh, when I first took, to, took it, it was going through and you, know, you had to write out the algorithms and you're, using, you're not even using like fit KNN. You know, you're writing every line. Mm -hmm. um, you're not using the app for your course. You know, so I think a lot of times, you know, although once a student might find it on their own, especially researchers, grad students, you know, uh, using it for their work, um, but we see a lot of people in industry because they just don't have time to learn. So, you know, they don't have time, maybe they have hopefully a half an hour to 45 minutes to learn uh, the speed dating version of uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, but that's why we f we see so many people uh, their eyes just light up when we show them the apps because mm -hmm. they don't have to start by reading you know white papers and textbooks or anything like that they can just go to town right and you could also note that like you travel a lot for work and you mm -hmm. actually go to conferences and 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 actual customer sites as well and this is where you're showing these tools to people and oh yeah. And they're yeah. actually using them afterwards. So yeah, one time I remember um, the guy actually texted me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. I don't know how he figured out that wasn't my um, work number. But <laughs> uh, we had we were going back and forth, and you know we were talking about this you know scikit learn model, and he was very resistant to you know oh the app oh what do you think I am some beginner you know he was very advanced, um, but I convinced him, and he texted me in the middle of the night actually, <laughs> and uh, says, I am so happy right now. Thank you so much. I never would have thought to use a nearest neighbor model. Like, it completely changed <laughs> everything for him. Um, and I now know not to give out uh, my number. Yep, that's a <laughs> to people that's a trying to do machine learning. <laughs> um, so yes, All right. this is very common. OK, so let's do five minutes speed dating of yes. unsupervised learning. All and right. we'll wrap up with any other questions that you have. Um, and then we'll go from there. All right, awesome. I have to make it count. <laughs> pressure's I'm on. timing you now. Pressure's so. on now. Oh my gosh. Here we go. Okay, so I'll just go through the script. Um, it's the same activity data that we were talking about before. Um, this is just really fun plots <laughs> for it. But so this is one of my favorites. So hierarchical, uh, K nearest neighbor, hierarchical are really common um, algorithms. Uh, K nearest neighbor is really similar to. Or, yeah, really similar to the nearest neighbor algorithms, um, where you know you're uh, doing sort of like the cluster, or sort of like the uh, classification, but you're now looking at the clusters around it. So that one's really easy to explain. The um, hierarchical is less so, but it's all it's sort of similar to the tree, where it's like learning patterns uh, from the data as it's going through the branches. So uh, when you step back, so in this case we had we added um, laying, sitting, and standing. So uh, to read these things, you like look at the bottom. So the uh, further away, you know, this kind of distance means they're less related. So uh, you can kind of look if you are clever with plotting, like me, not really. Um, you can see that some of them kind of cluster together. So you know, laying was sort of over here. You know, sitting and standing were kind of lumped together. You can change some of the parameters of the dendrogram and look at the results. And this was like very limited time spent tweaking anything, and it clustered sitting and standing together, laying, and then walking stuff together. So these are the kinds of things that you can get a lot of information about. I mean, Joanna mm -hmm. asked, you know, what's the difference between sitting and standing? And it's just, <laughs> who knows? You know, maybe this would have told us that something is kind of sticking out a little funny. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Wow, that, that was That quick. was it. See, that was five <laughs> more than or less than uh, five minutes. All right. Um, do you um, <laughs> do you um, um, uh, what about um, like uh, error estimate uh, estimate estimation? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble speaking right now. Error estimation um, for um, machine learning, um, just in general. Like, do you uh, and more specifically on unsupervised machine learning? Ah, uh, good. So, yeah, there there are. Um, 
a lot of different ways for unsupervised. It's not as uh, standard. Like I think it's much easier for supervised because you know like mean squared error means something, and you know class misclassification rate are you know definitely the most popular. For unsupervised, it tends to be um, the silhouette value, which is the ratio of in cluster to out of cluster uh, cl clusterings. <laughs> so you know you know what they're supposed to be, so you can um, use that. So it's basically just you know. Was it what we expected? Um, and then, if you want to, oh my god, I could talk about this forever. But <laughs> so, if you look, if you look in the documentation, there are some good examples for silhouette because there's also a plot that comes with it where you can kind of see um, like each data point almost like a histogram. So that's a really common one. Um, and then there's also like a, a Kolinsky. Help. Okay, wow. All right, sorry, people. This is way mathy, um, but it does like a, a covariance distance. So like, there's a couple different measures um, that you can uh, change. And another really powerful function in MATLAB is eval clusters. Mm. So that's sort of the equivalent of um, the app, where it just tries all of them. So you can um, try different, you know, say you're doing um, k, uh, k means, you can try different values of k. You can try different, um, you know, algorithms and whatnot. So that's a good one if you're interested. Okay, excellent. So any final thoughts before wrapping up? I think we've gone through the questions that we're going to answer, um, and maybe just a. Quick summary, or yeah. So this is it was very fun for me. Um, I love this stuff. So you know, hopefully uh, this was helpful for you. And you know, I definitely encourage you to check out the doc, check out you know the mm -hmm. links that we were talking about for more. Um, and thank you so much. I I will take a look at the comments. You know, maybe over the weekend, uh, and you know, see if we can um, add any more to anything we missed. So thank you so much, and I really appreciate it. Keep it coming. Yeah, absolutely.